So we've reached the end of another year of this uh, Paulson Institute Harris School Contemporary China series. So we hope uh, everyone at the university has enjoyed the series as much as we enjoy bringing it to uh, campus. And I'm glad that we can finish it off with our friend Arthur Grover. Arthur, so you know, we do this series uh, once a month. And this is the end of our third year doing this. And we'll be back next year with, we even have some speakers lined up already for next year. So we'll be back in October to do it again. Um, in any case, we're gonna, we're gonna finish it off by talking about the Chinese economy, which is uh, right in the wheelhouse of the Paulson Institute, since we're an institute that focuses on economics in the first instance and the environment in the second. Um, and uh, as I was saying in an event that we did with Arthur this morning, this is a good time to be talking about the Chinese economy, in part because everybody seems to be talking about the Chinese economy. This is a time in the global economy where I would say almost every major country, Japan, uh, European Union, United States, China, India, are facing uh, very fraught, difficult, and politically contentious processes of structural adjustment and the need for reform. Uh, but in China, probably more than in any other, uh, there is uh, kind of more speculation, sometimes more hysteria. You turn on the TV in one of these business shows and they'll tell you that China's gonna fall off the cliff by next Tuesday. Uh, they're on the verge of collapse. Maybe they're not on the verge of collapse. Sometimes they're on the verge of collapse and on the verge of taking over the world in the same sentence or in the same program. But uh, that is not to poo-poo or understate the severity uh, of the challenges that the Chinese economy is facing. And uh, I think in a lot of ways, partly because they've had such a good run since the 1970s, uh, they are under the microscope of attention, uh, particularly from the markets, but also from people who are interested in economic policy generally, more than almost any other major economy. And they're facing a lot of problems, short-term headwinds, short-term problems, overcapacity, uh, getting some, some uh, near-term growth, uh, medium-term problems like debt, corporate debt, government debt, less on the household debt side, but lots of debt and leverage all over that system. And then long-term problem, which is really the fundamental one, which is where the growth driver is gonna come from uh, in an economy that's changing and getting diminishing returns on the existing model. And so um, in that environment where there's so much scrutiny of the Chinese economy and where so many people are talking about it, but not always, in my view, in a particularly educated way, uh, it's great to have Arthur here because uh, as someone who's not just followed his work, but uh, learned from it and relied on it for a long time. Um, he is uh, not only, I'd say, one of the most important voices on the Chinese economy today, um, but also one of the most balanced and uh, thoughtful. Um, Arthur runs a research firm, it's really the leading China economics research firm called Dragonomics. Uh, out of Beijing and Hong Kong and sometimes New York, uh, but also is a very prolific writer, speaker uh, on all things China and the economy, everywhere from foreign policy to the Washington Post, the New York Times, and so on. So, Arthur, uh, we thought we'd have you uh, come and give us your insights based, I should add, on uh, a new book that Arthur has out called with the very... Uh, very you're right, it's not called that. Well, anyway, with the very focused title, China's Economy, What Everyone Needs to Know, available in all fine bookshops uh, or on Amazon.com now. So we encourage you to buy it. Uh, and I think after you hear Arthur, you're probably going to want to buy it. It's great to be here. Thanks for showing up. Um, I will uh, try to spend about 20 or 25 minutes, hopefully not more than that, uh, running through um, a few ideas, uh, basically to give you some context of, of where I think China's growth has come from, how they got to the position uh, that they're in today, what the challenges are, and some scenarios for how things might play out over the next five to 10 years. So this is going to be a very, uh, very high level view. We're going to be running through some very big things, uh, but then there'll be plenty of time afterwards in the discussion period to talk about either those bigger ideas or just uh, shorter term uh, concerns that people might have about what's going on in China uh, right now. Um, and as, as Evan mentioned, um, what I'm presenting now is a, a set of ideas that uh, came out of this book that I uh, just published with uh, Oxford, which is meant to be kind of a one-stop shop for people who want to get a 
clear and complete picture of how China went from being really a backwater in the 1970s to the world's second biggest economy today, the world's biggest trading nation, uh, and a very, very important uh, uh, force in global technology, global geop uh, geopolitics, and so forth. Uh, it's one of the great, uh, most extraordinary transformations of our time, and there was no one place that you could go to explain the economic dimension of this. Uh, and it builds on work that I and my colleagues at Dragonomics have done over the last uh, 15 to 20 years in Beijing. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, first of all, discuss why China was so successful in its growth. And I think there are uh, two or three things that you need to think about when you try to answer this question. The first is that there's a way in which China's growth is kind of boring, actually. Um, what they did is, I mean, it was very large, but they, they took a, an established recipe for how you get rich, and they copied it. Um, and this recipe is sometimes called the East Asian Developmental State. It actually has its roots uh, before that in um, uh, 19th century Germany, wh which went through a development process that was guided by uh, a guy called Friedrich List, a prominent uh, Prussian economist of the mid-19th century. And he actually borrowed a lot, took a lot of his ideas from an examination of how the United States grew in the early part of the 19th century. So we have a tradition of how do you, as a relatively backward uh, country, move fast <laughs> Uh, and catch up with the global leaders. This has been successfully refined. And in post-war Asia, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan did an exceptionally uh, good job of this. And basically, the recipe involves, a, a, first of all, establishing equal ownership of, of agriculture so you don't have big landlords, essentially, that can get in the way of an industrialization process. And you have small farmers who generate a, a very large uh, surplus. Uh, of savings, which you can then capture in a financial system that's either owned or directed by the state. And then the state takes that money, invests it, number one, in infrastructure, and number two, in export-oriented manufacturing. And, and basically, this is the only proven, surefire way to go from being a poor country to being a rich country. There is no example of a country that has really uh, done it any other way. Um, so when China was emerging in the late 1970s, they looked around and said, OK, we're really poor. How do we get rich? They looked at their neighbors, and they said, oh, well, they seem to have done pretty well. We'll, we'll copy that. Um, and they have essentially used that formula with a couple of interesting exceptions. So exception number one uh, was that they relied much more heavily than the other East Asian countries on foreign direct investment. Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, basically, they shut out foreign companies and all of their growth was generated by domestic firms. China famously, in the 1980s, invited foreign companies in through joint ventures. And by the mid-1990s, uh, about one-sixth of all fixed investment in China was coming from foreign companies. It's come down quite a lot since then. But for a period of time, um, the, the foreign role in investment was very large. And even today, about half of China's exports uh, come from foreign invested companies. This is an unusual twist. Uh, why did China choose to do that? I think there are basically two reasons. One is that when they entered the world stage, they were much farther behind than other countries had been. And I think they looked at that and said, there's no way we can catch up on our own. We need to invite uh, foreign companies in uh, to teach us how to do things. Uh, I think the second uh, factor, though, was political. Uh, so one feature that the other East Asian countries shared uh, that China did not was that they were all essentially part of the US uh, security arrangements in Asia. And so part of the deal, I think, that they got was that they agreed to be uh, the bulwarks of uh, the US presence in Asia. And in exchange, they got pretty free access to US markets and not much pressure until they became much richer um, for, uh, to, to let US companies uh, uh, enter their markets. China wasn't part of that arrangement, wanted to retain its geopolitical independence, and so therefore had to pay another price of admission. And I think essentially that was allowing foreign companies in. Second uh, key difference between China and the other East Asian models was a much heavier reliance on state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, quite obviously, is an outgrowth of the second major dimension of the Chinese growth story, 
which is that it's a, what you call a post-communist transition economy. So they started out in the late 1970s with the state basically owning all of the means of production. And we've progressively had a, um, a privatization of the, of the economy, if not of the state-owned enterprises themselves over the last 35 years. And this gradual transfer of resources away from the state, relatively inefficient state sector, to the relatively more efficient private sector has also been a, a big source of growth. Um, but throughout, the Communist Party has, has made it very clear that they want to maintain their grip on political power, and they did not want to allow alternative power structures to emerge. And so having a large state-owned enterprise sector has been an important part of this mechanism of political control. It's also been an important part of the way that the economy is regulated and managed. I, I think in the US and many Western economies, we're used to the notion of a regulatory state, where the state doesn't necessarily own a lot of economic assets, but it has enormous regulatory powers to adjust the market. In China, the regulatory functions are relatively weak. Um, the regulators do not really have much independent authority, but the government has a lot of ability to regulate markets via its owner ownership of state-owned enterprises. Um, I think the other feature of this transition from state to market that's really important to understand is that um, when China was going through its reforms in the early 1980s uh, and into the 90s, there were a lot of people uh, running around trying to figure out how you move from a communist to a more market-driven economy. And I think the analysis of many Western economists was that really what mattered was private ownership of assets. So if you transferred the ownership of assets from the state to private uh, firms, private firms would do a better job of managing those assets, and that's how you achieved your goals. The Chinese looked at that and said, no, we're not going to do that. We think that the key to a, market, a successful market economy is competition. So we're going to create a lot of market mechanisms that create more competition in the marketplace. Um, uh, but we're not going to just privatize state-owned assets. And the theory was that if you have a more competitive environment, even the state-owned enterprises would have to up their game. And that actually turned out to be a very successful uh, mechanism. So what they did was they uh, uh, streamlined the state-owned enterprise sector, allowed uh, the private sector to grow up around it, uh, but maintained uh, a big state enterprise sector that was never privatized as a mechanism of regulation and control. Um, and so this, this recipe of gradual uh, growing out of the plan, as it's sometimes called, uh, combined with the uh, uh, traditional elements of the, um, uh, of the East Asian development model work quite successfully. Um, the third element I think that we need to bear in mind as we look ahead is demographics. So uh, China had a very, very favorable demographic situation from the mid-1970s until about five years ago. Uh, and the simplest way to think about this is that is through what's called the dependency ratio. So if you look at the number of young, under 15-year-old, or old, over 65-year-old people who are normally considered dependents, non, not productive workers, you take that number of people as a proportion of the active working age population. That's your dependency ratio. And in 1975, China had a dependency ratio of about 80 dependents, young and old, for every 100 workers. Over the last 35 years, that fell in half to 40. So you had a huge expansion in the working age population. You didn't have too many young and old people to take care of. And that can be associated with very high growth rates. And one of the challenges that China faces today uh, is that that process is now going in reverse, basically because the population is aging. And over the next 25 years, you're going to have to 50% or more increase in the dependency ratio. Um, so the, um, as we look at China today, that's how they got to where they are. I think they have um, uh, a, a basic task, which is that they need to move from a uh, what I would call a capital mobilization phase of growth into a capital efficiency phase of growth. And what I mean by that is that for most of the last 35 years, the single most important task 
uh, in the economy generally was to build up the capital stock of a, of a modern economy. So put in the infrastructure, put in the basic industries, put in the housing, put on all the basic elements that you need uh, for a modern economy. And while you're doing that, uh, a large state-owned enterprise sector can actually be a very effective uh, agent uh, of, a, of a big construction project because they're not tied to short-term quarterly profit uh, uh, goals. They can afford to take a, long, a more long-term objective. Um, but as you move, as you have essentially complete the process of building out this capital stock, then you don't get so much growth from the sheer process of installing capital. And one way that in, in economics you think about that is to look at the capital output ratio, so the, the ratio between the, the total value of your capital stock and your annual output, or GDP. For an OECD economy, this ratio is typically about 3 to 1. Um, China in the 1970s had a, a ratio that was only half that. So they had a very, very low capital endowment. So for the last 35 years, they've installed a lot of capital. And the process of installing that capital has, has generated a lot of growth. But they're now at the point where the capital stock, depending on how you measure it, is somewhere between 2 and a half or 3 times of GDP. So it's very, very close to an OECD level. And it's certainly adequate for an upper middle income country, which is basically what China is today. So what that means is that you don't get uh, a lot of bang for your buck now with, the late, with installing another mile of road or another mile of railroad or another power plant or another port. Um, that just, just does not generate much higher returns. Where you have to get your growth from is generating the, the, the greatest possible return out of the assets that you've already installed. So you have to think less in terms of building and more in terms of maximizing your, your return. That's a very, very different mindset. It requires very different kinds of tools and very different kinds of agents. And I think this points to a, a central problem. When we look at China today and we analyze you know, what's going on with economic reforms, and are, are they succeeding or not, I think the big challenge is that there has always been in China a trade-off or, or a conflict between the desire of the, uh, of the Communist Party to control the political system exclude all rivals and, and, and basically be in charge of everything. So there's a control objective. But on the other hand, there's also a strong economic growth objective. And the economic growth objective is we want to have an economy that's growing as fast as possible. And the question basically becomes, what happens when your control objective collides with your economic growth objective? How do you resolve that conflict? And the record of the party since the late 70s has been very, very good in, in coming up with trade-offs uh, that allow both of those desires to be satisfied. They have been very, very good uh, repeatedly in the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s at surrendering tactically pieces of political control in order to get more economic growth. And why have they been willing to do that? Why have they not just been obsessed with the political objective? And I think the, the reason has to do both with Chinese history and with an examination of the fate of other uh, communist regimes. The element from Chinese history is that every Chinese government since the mid-19th century, whether communist or otherwise, has had to deal with this core fact that China used to be the biggest economy in the world, the most powerful uh, country in Asia, a major global power. And then they went off the rails in the 19th century. They failed to industrialize, and they fell far behind. So the task of any Chinese government has been to restore China's greatness as a global power. And it's been recognized, long been recognized, that a very, very important core component of that is having a powerful and successful economy. So the notion that you have to be wealthy and that wealth is a route to power uh, is very deeply embedded in the uh, Chinese uh, uh, governing elite's consciousness. The other factor is that uh, Chinese authorities have spent a lot of time looking at the fate of the Soviet Union. And they've uh, conducted two major studies of why the Soviet Union collapsed. And they came up with a lot of reasons. But one of the core reasons that they uh, focused in on was that the Soviet Union did a very bad job of, of uh, organizing its economy. They allowed the economy to stagnate and, um, 
and that that economic stagnation then led to a, a political crisis. So there's a consciousness that both for the purpose of restoring China to its rightful place, as, as Chinese elites would see it, as a global power, and to avoid the fate of the other major communist power, the Soviet Union, it's necessary to have a vibrant economy. So essentially, the leadership has been willing to make the trade-off again and again. Yes, we don't like giving up control, but actually we know that we need to give up control over agriculture or over manufacturing or over prices or over the trading system. We need to let more foreign companies participate. Why? Because this is the way that we can get a more vibrant economy. In the long run, even though we sacrifice control tactically in this area or that area today, in the long run, our ability to generate a, a powerful economy will underpin the legitimacy of the Communist Party, and it will make our control stronger in the long run. So that's, they've been very successful at that for many years, and I think the question that we all have today is whether they're willing to make those same trade-offs again. And it's, I think that the task is much trickier um, because of the, the nature of the economic challenges, and there seems to be a great uh, uh, deal more reluctance. So we have fundamentally, I think, three challenges that face the uh, government uh, today. One is this shift from a capital mobilization to a capital efficiency economy, which basically means that you need to have a lot smaller state sector and a much bigger market sector. And so it's the same kind of trade-off that they've made for the last 35 years, but it's on a much bigger scale. And I think the, the trade-offs that they see cut much more deeply at the roots of the pillars of Communist Party authority. So it's politically uh, even more difficult to do than the pre previous trade-offs between control and growth. Second, we have a demographic transition from a young to an old society, as I discussed. And I think it is really important to understand how much growth came in the past from positive demographics and how much it could be retarded in the future from negative demographics. That's a very, very big headwind. And that just makes the, the problem of this transition much more difficult to execute. And then I think the final one is uh, that in order to make this, this economic transition, you need to have some kind of changes in the governance structure. Uh, this does not necessarily mean a transition to a, uh, a Western-style democracy, but it does mean, uh, I think, a transition to a more uh, flexible, more inclusive, more participatory uh, form of governance on, on many dimensions. And this is very, very difficult uh, for a authoritarian one-party state to pull off. Um, so uh, I'm going to run through a, a couple of pictures just to illustrate some of these ideas so that you get a perhaps more concrete sense of what I'm talking about. Um, so this chart illustrates the, uh, essentially encapsulates the, trans, uh, the transition from a, a building economy to a return on assets economy. This shows uh, construction of housing in China. And what you can see is that uh, since the mid 80s until about five years ago, we had a very steep increase in the construction of housing. That's the blue line. Um, just in the last 10 years or so, we basically had a doubling uh, of uh, annual construction of housing. And this is kind of representative of what things are like in, a, in a, the capital mobilization phase of growth. You have every year you have to build more and more, whether it's housing or steel plants or petrochemical plants or um, electric uh, uh, power generation plants than you did the year before. But then you get to a point where actually you don't need to increase that amount every year. So the growth flattens out. And then, as you can see, our projection, the red line showing our model of housing construction, over time, the annual amount of housing that you need to build will go down. And this applies basically to every other uh, sort of infrastructure uh, project or, or uh, uh, industry that you could name. Uh, we no longer had to have to accelerate the growth in, um, in building of our physical plant. Uh, in fact, that demand has started to peak, uh, has peaked, and is now going to start to decline. And when you can no longer rely on this uh, uh, greater and greater need for capital resources as a source of growth, you have to look elsewhere, and that elsewhere is is basically just in productivity growth. Um, this is the demographics. So the red line is the dependency ratio, so the ratio of 
non-workers to workers, basically. And you can see that it declined uh, steadily from 1975 to 2010. And it declined entirely because the younger population was shrinking. You just weren't having as many uh, children. You can see that the old population actually remained quite static as a share of the total population. The line, the vertical line, represents where we are uh, today. And as we move ahead, we see that the dependency ratio is steadily rising, and it's rising entirely because of a rise in the, in the older population. The uh, younger population uh, declines and then stabilizes. Uh, and this is a very, very difficult transition to go through. And this is my favorite chart that represents the, 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 the problem that you have in the allocation of resources between the state and the private sector. Uh, so what this shows is just the return on assets in industrial enterprises divided between private or non-state companies, which is the blue, and state-owned companies, which is the red. And what's interesting here is that you see that up until 2008, uh, the return on assets among all companies was rising very steadily, and the gap between private and state-owned returns was pretty low. So private companies did a better job, generally, than state companies, but it wasn't that much better, and all boats were rising. And I think what this demonstrates is that when you're in this capital construction phase of growth, state-owned companies can be a very uh, viable part of the mix. But since 2008, which was the global financial crisis, we've seen a huge divergence. And we saw that all companies had a bad time in the year after the financial crisis. But then the private companies rebounded very smartly um, and have maintained extremely high levels of return on assets. Whereas state-owned companies had a bit of a recovery and then started to deteriorate again. And now there's about a three to one ratio uh, between the, the rate of return in private companies and industry and state own companies. And I think what this reflects is that we are now, we've moved into a new era where the role that state companies played, which is basically building infrastructure, is just generating much less returns than it would five or 10 years ago. And so you need to think about a new way of allocating resources. And the problem is that state owned companies on average borrow about twice as much money um, on average as private companies do. So they're borrowing twice as much money they're generating only one third of the return. Is it any surprise that China now has an economy where growth is slowing, your return is slowing, but your level of debt continues to rise? I think not. I think it, it basically boils down to the problems in the state-owned enterprise sector. So when we look ahead, what, where, where are the ways, where are the paths that China could take? They have this problem, they need to move from, a, from an economy that's focused mainly on building stuff to an economy that's mainly focused on generating a higher return on assets, and as part of that, relying much, much more on consumer demand as, a, as an engine of growth, as opposed to businesses' demand for equipment and materials. Um, and they're doing this in the context of a very strong demographic headwind and in the context of a political system that may or may not be willing to make the key political trade-offs that are necessary to move into that new stage of growth. So how could it play out? Well, I'm going to present three uh, possibilities. There are many others that you could come up with, uh, but these are ones that I think are, are most interesting to think about. Um, one is what I call Singapore, Singapore on steroids. And what this means is that basically the party gets its act together and they manage to execute the reforms that are necessary to stabilize growth and stabilize debt over the next five years. And essentially what this means is cutting the state-owned enterprise sector in half, basically by hiving off the least productive parts of it, retaining a lot of the centrally controlled SOEs that are important to re for regulatory functions, and some of them are actually fairly high-performing enterprises, but, but getting rid of the deadwood in the state sector. Deregulating a lot of the private, uh, uh, the service uh, industries, uh, which have a lot of regulatory barriers to private sector investment, things like healthcare, education, uh, logistics, uh, finance, and so forth. So you open up much more territory for private firms to invest in and generate more productivity growth. Um, and restructuring the financial sector. Um, and this will require recapitalizing of the banks. Uh, ensuring that you have systems in place to, to, to make sure that banks and other financial institutions put money into productive enterprises and not into 
politically connected state enterprises, and probably a bigger role for capital markets. And if you do all of these things and some associated reforms in the tax system and so forth, you can imagine that China by 2020 gets to a point where growth stabilizes not at the current level of 6.5%, but probably around 5%, which would be a terrific outcome for a, uh, uh, a country at this level of income. And debt stops rising. So you have stable debt level. You have growth that's rolling along at about 5%. Most of that growth is coming from productivity increases and consumer spending. Um, and you still have the Communist Party pretty tightly in control, but it's kind of in a Singapore model where uh, they, are, they, are, they put in place a somewhat more responsive uh, government, uh, somewhat more responsive judicial system, and so forth. I think this would be a very positive outcome for China. Uh, it would mainly be a positive outcome for the rest of the world. The world is deeply in need of sustainable sources of demand. And I think a China that is growing uh, sustainably at 5% without an increase in leverage would be very helpful for the rest of the world. I think there are some geopolitical consequences of this that are, will be tough to deal with because a successful uh, China with a strong Communist Party uh, in control will definitely be more assertive. Um, and try to carve out a bigger sphere of influence in, in Asia. And I think that will be uh, a, a challenge for the international system to deal with. But on the whole, it's a good scenario. So the second and third scenarios are variations on the what if they don't get reforms right theme. So both of these uh, imply economic problems. Um, and the first one I call retreat to nationalism. And, and basically, the hypothesis here is that for political reasons, the, the country is unable to do the reforms that they need to do. Uh, growth slows down quite a lot. And the reaction of the government is, or the party, is to say, oh, well, we can't get people to like us because we're raising their living standards. Therefore, we will try to get them to like us because we will make China stand tall internationally. And so we will double down on some of more, our more aggressive and adventurous foreign policy initiatives. And this essentially conceptualizes as China becoming a lot more like today's Russia. Uh, a, a country that doesn't really have a great uh, economic system, but has enough financial resources to start to throw its way, weight around uh, geopolitically. And I think this is clearly a bad scenario for Chinese people in terms of their welfare. And it's clearly a bad and destabilizing scenario for the global system. Um, the third scenario, however, I think is more likely. And I'll spend a little bit more time fleshing this out, because I think it, it is, I think, more it's more grounded in the realities of, of China's history and, and social structure. It's what I call Japan 2.0. And essentially here the scenario is, again, because of political reasons, uh, the, the government is unable to make all of the reforms that it needs to to get growth back on track. So growth continues to slow down. The debt level continues to rise. And they basically get stuck in a low growth, high uh, debt um, situation. They're enabled to forestall a financial crisis because the debt basically is uh, denominated in domestic currency. It's all circulating internally. So like Japan, they can uh, keep borrowing and spending their own money uh, without a blow up, but you, the, the economy stagnates. And the difference with the previous scenario is here I postulate that the response of the government will be to say, oh, we're not getting the economic growth. Therefore, we have to work twice as hard through other mechanisms to maintain domestic social stability. So what that probably means is more and more government borrowing to finance social welfare programs or infrastructure programs that keep people employed and keep people happy and prevent them from uh, engaging in, in uh, political hijinks. Um, and under this scenario, China does wind up in the 2020s with a stagnant growth scenario. Um, but it doesn't result, it results in a turn inward rather than a turn outward. Um, and so I wanted to spend a, a couple more minutes before we go into Q&A exploring, okay, does this comparison really make sense and what can we learn from it? And I think when I started to explore this idea, what I found was interesting was that, yeah, China does have a lot of similarities with Japan, but with Japan at different points in the past. So if we just look at the financial elements, the rising debt and the, and the problems of uh, a, 
uh, sort of a, a, a pact between the government and politically collect connected enterprises that it's difficult to entangle. China looks a lot like Japan in the 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. A little bit fragile and unable to make some key choices. Um, demographically, though, it looks like Japan about 10 years earlier. And if you look at it as just in terms of its per capita income and stage of development, it looks like Japan in the early 1970s. So a couple of illustrations of that. This is a, slightly hard to read. Basically, the red is China. The other dots are the other East Asian, major East Asian economies. And what this does is it plots average GDP growth against your per capita GDP. So basically what it says, as you get richer, growth gets slower. But where China is now, it's maybe a little bit hard to see. Uh, on a purchasing power adjusted basis, it's about $12,000 per capita income. What you can see is that at that point, when the other East Asian economies reached that point, they were still able to sustain uh, uh, growth rates of 5% or more for quite a number of years after that. So the point being that China has the ability, if they do a few things right in policy, to generate quite high rates of growth for another 10, 15, even 20 years. And this was something that Japan was not really in a position to do in 1990. If you look at the demographics, again, China, uh, this looks at the ratio of people of working age to people of retirement age. So it's a worker to retiree, re retiree ratio. China, it's about six to one today, the same as Japan in the early 80s. So that's very good. It means that you have a lot to play with in terms of a, a very productive workforce and not too many retirees to, to support. But it's deteriorating, deteriorating very quickly. In about 25 years, the age structure of China will be the same as it is in Japan today. So they're going through a demographic transition that is the same as Japan's, but much more quickly. Um, so that creates a, a big challenge. And then this is what everyone worries about, is the debt ratio. You can see um, these are gross jet debt to GDP ratios for a variety of countries. China is the red line. You can see that up until 2009, it was pretty low. And it has zoomed up, and it is now basically the world's champion of debt and growing very rapidly. So you have, um, I think, a number of dimensions that enable you to say, well, OK, yeah, China is replicating certain aspects of the Japan experience, but they're replicating uh, it's sort of in a telescoped fashion. They're like three phases of Japanese history all at one time. So the question is, which will win out? So when we conclude this comparison, I think here's what we come down on. First of all, because China is an earlier stage of growth, earlier stage of development, lower down on the technological chain, therefore a lot more potential growth from simply catching up technologically. China has a lot more growth drivers to play with than Japan did when it got into financial uh, trouble in 1990. So that's a positive element. If you get the policies right, you can get a lot of growth out of China for a long time to come. Uh, second big difference is that Japan ran into trouble in 1990 because it had a huge asset bubble where land prices and equity prices went to stratospheric heights um, and then collapsed by about 75% in the space of three years. China has problems, but it does not have that problem. There is no asset bubble comparable to what Japan had. And again, what this means is that, yes, you may have difficulties, but you're not going to have to deal with a sudden shock tomorrow. Uh, you can deal with these problems gradually over time. So an incremental approach to reform is a viable strategy. You just have to get moving in the right direction. And then the final difference, this circles back to a comment that I made at the, at the beginning about the different geopolitical situation that China finds itself in, is that China, unlike Japan, is a fully independent geopolitical actor. Uh, they have their vision uh, of, of being a completely autonomous you know, great power in Asia. Um, this has a couple of consequences. You also have a political system um, where there's an authoritarian government that has decided that it really, in order to stay in power, it has to get the economy right. So both from the standpoint of the, the party knows that it needs to get the economy right in order to stay in power, and it knows it needs to get the economy right to fulfill its great power aspirations. There are a lot of incentives working on the elite power structure to do the right things um, for economic reform. Um, so the, the constraints that Japan was operating on 
under in 1990, which enabled it essentially to choose a path of what you might call genteel retirement. Okay, we won't get any growth, but that's fine because we're rich and America will protect us, so we don't really need to worry about those things. That really is not an option. Uh, for, from the standpoint of the Chinese leadership. So it creates certain kinds of pressures for a more activist uh, uh, solution. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, I think I've probably left a lot of questions unanswered, at least I hope so. Uh, any questions that I do not answer here are all answered in my book, which is in fact written, <laughs> it's written in Q&A format. So if you have a question that you don't get answered here, you can buy the book, find your question, and you'll find the answer there. My name is uh, Robert Bornholtz. Uh, I wonder whether within the Singapore on steroids option, there are two options, two sub-options. One would be along the lines that the party maintains control and with the idea that they're extracting rents and distributing those to a, like a power-maintaining oligarchy. And so they don't want to liberalize and then another direction, which would be more in the direction of rule of law and uh, constitutional rights, which would actually generate more economic growth, but arguably also less conflict with yep. the United States and its neighbors, because it uh, would not have to engage in some measure of yep. nationalist uh, adventures. Yep. So that one could imagine a more conflictual direction in the Singapore on steroids and a less yeah yeah no I think they're clearly all of these all of these pathways branch out in different ways um, I guess the central point I would make is first of all I, there are clearly some things that they just have to do to get right uh, they have to get right in order to get economic growth so uh, having a large-scale distribution of rents to oligarchies uh, that is not going to get you to um, a successful outcome. I, I think that gets you into kind of a middle income trap outcome, and it does not enable you to sustain high rates of growth in future. Um, I think the other um, point I would like to highlight in response to this question is that it really is, for years and years and years, I've been traveling in China since 1986, working there since 1991, on and off, and for as long as I've been doing that, people have been coming out and saying, look, this, this this combination that you have of a Leninist state and an increasingly market-driven economy, this is unsustainable. It is, it is in inherently unstable, and one of these things will have to give way at some point. And the striking thing is those predictions have been pretty consistently wrong for 30 years. Uh, and I think that's one of the great conundrums of China is that, that, that that's a very plausible argument, but it has been proven wrong time and time again. And I think the question is, are we now getting closer to that point where it really is uh, there is some kind of fundamental incompatibility between the kind of political control, control structure they want and the kind of economy they want. I think Singapore, the reason I threw Singapore in there is that I think that offers in the minds of many leaders a kind of a model um, for how you can have an economy that works very, very well. You can have you know, a judicial system, for example, that enables people to have some sense that they have a right of redress, but it really doesn't undermine the ability of this one party to control everything at the end of the day. I think that's kind of what they would like to get to. Um, we know that it works in Singapore, which is a population of five million. Uh, I think we are entitled to question whether that could possibly work in a continental-sized country of 1.4 billion people, and I, I have my doubts on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm Lei. Uh, I'm the uh, a PhD student in statistics here. So uh, thank you very much for your for your talk. And uh, I have a comment and a question. The comment is about the uh, two goals: uh, maintaining the power and stimulating the economy. So uh, it sounds like a fine tuning in your presentation, but I'm not. I'm, I'm sure you know that it's not that uh, always that smooth in reality. For example, 1989 was such a episode that the two goals were so in yes. irreconcilable that the party had to solve it by yep. brute force. Right. And this episode and other uh, similar disaster uh, being repeated in future is not a zero probability event, let's put it this way. So uh, my question is, with all these in mind, all your uh, uh, fabulous uh, analysis and all this risk in mind, what do you think in the most Machiavellian sense, uh, the three scenarios which most fits 
American national interest. And if you, <laughs> and if you are a political advisor to the next president, whoever she is, uh, uh, what would you advise the next president of the United States to take maybe cope with America, uh, China's future or even take advantage of that? Thank yeah. you. Uh, that is unfortunately a very, very good question. Um, <laughs> so just, just on, your, on, your first, on your first point, your comment, yes, I totally agree with you. Sort of when you summarize you know, 35 years of very complex history in 15 minutes, you tend to brush over, you know, some bumps in the road. And yet it is, it was clearly not at all a smooth process. But I think if you do look back at it, what's extraordinary about China compared to pretty much any other developing country you can name is how much growth they did get, how inclusive that was, and how they managed essentially to keep a uh, continuous political order um, in shape throughout that process. It was not by any means easy, but it, it's, it's an extraordinary accomplishment. And I think that needs to be recognized. But I agree with you, not, not at all smooth, as it seems in retrospect. What is the one that is most in the American national interest? Um, uh, basically, I think it would be, of those three, the first one. I mean, I, I think it is very clearly the case that uh, America's national interest is much better served by a China that is strong, prosperous, and stable. Um, the alternatives, if it's not prosperous, the risk that it becomes substantially more unstable uh, and conflict-oriented internally and perhaps, uh, perhaps externally, a much more unpredictable force, I think that is basically bad for the region, uh, first of all. First of all, for the Chinese people, second of all, for the region, and third of all, for American national interests. I think that the problem is that America has to be realistic about, uh, first of all, what its actual as opposed to its fantasy national interests are. And I think sometimes uh, in DC you get this notion that basically there is nothing in the entire world that does not impinge on US national interests. A very expansive view that we have to be in control of everything that's going on everywhere in the world. And if we're not doing that, then this is a dangerous sign of decline in American power. And that kind of uh, top of the hill uh, mentality, I think, can be very dangerous. So I think from the US standpoint, we have to, first of all, recognize that a strong, prosperous, and stable China is essentially in the US national interest more than pretty much any other kind of China that we can imagine. Um, but that, that requires us to look very closely at what our core interests are and to, to understand that a strong, prosperous, and stable China is going to have a much, much bigger role in, um, in governing the global economy and in influencing its immediate region than we have been accustomed to. And that requires some kind of adjustment. Uh, and that is, I think Evan can also attest to this as someone who spends a lot of time in Washington. Um, this is a, that kind of mental adjustment is something that is very, very, very difficult uh, for the American system to do. So that is my preferred scenario, but it requires a lot of hard and careful work on both sides to make sure that it does end happily and not in some kind of a conflict. Uh, yeah. Hi there. Uh, Richard Vanellos. I'm a student at uh, Harris School of Public Policy. So currently, you'll either have to get the mic working or speak up a bit. Uh, so currently, China has about 250 percent of their GDP in debt. Yeah. 150 percent of that is in their state-owned companies. I don't see a scenario that isn't doomsday for China without incredible growth. So, is there a framework in the Netherlands, the Netherlands government to be able to restructure that debt and not suffocate uh, the economy? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a fair point. So I'll, I'll just refine that a little bit. Um, so corporate debt in China is about 160% of GDP. Uh, and I agree, that's where the main problem is. Uh, not all of that is state-owned enterprise debt. A fair amount of that is private sector debt. Um, the, but I agree that the, the core problem in, in China as far as debt is concerned is that state-owned enterprises borrow way too much and deliver far, far too little return. And yeah, it's very easy to construct a scenario um, where they restructure that debt and move on their way. Um, if you look back to the 1990s, um, China had non-performing loans, mainly to state-owned enterprises, were close to 50% of GDP. So the, the non-performing debt problem 
relative to GDP was, the debt was smaller, but the non-performing component was much, much larger relative to GDP uh, than it is today. Uh, and they solved that problem by restructuring the state-owned enterprises and restructuring the financial sector, uh, basically bankrupting or warehousing a whole bunch of uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, recapitalizing the banks, taking the bad loans out of the banking systems into system into asset management companies, increasing the national, uh, the sovereign debt. There was about a 16 percent uh, 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 GDP increase in the government debt level, uh, which basically reflected the recapitalization costs um, for the banking sector. You know, you probably have uh, to do all of that today would, would increase the, uh, the, the debt of the central government by probably 10 to 15 percent of GDP when you're done. Um, that's clearly manageable. So I, I don't think that this is a technical problem. Uh, it's not easy. It's, it's hard work. It's laborious. But conceptually, uh, you can imagine a situation where they slim down. They do what they did before. They slim down. They cut the, private, the state owned enterprise sector in half. They recapitalize and reorient the financial sector. They deregulate a bunch of, uh, of controlled sectors so that private companies uh, create demand for productive credit in those sectors. And um, yeah, it is, it is easily achievable. Not, not easily achievable. It is conceptually achievable. It's hard to pull off, but it's not hard to pull off because no one can figure out how to do it. It's hard to pull off just because you have to do the political work to make that acceptable uh, to the elites. And that seems to be what is the problem right now. It's, it, is, it is not a technical economic problem. It is a political problem of can you get everyone on board to agreeing that this needs to be done. And so far, the government has not been able to do that. Yeah, next to him. So you talked a little bit about the tension that everyone says is going to take China down for 30 years and hasn't between the Leninist, Leninist and capitalist systems. Is, what are the chances you see that actually coming through? And what does that scenario look like? So what, what, if, if that were to happen, what do you think the chances are of that happening? I'm sorry, if, if what were to happen? If the, if the party were to, if the party actually were to collapse or so, what, what is, if, yeah. yeah what are the I, chances of that and what are the mechanisms well, if it happens? I, I tend to think that the chances of that are pretty low in the short run. The short run being the next certainly five years, probably 10 years. Uh, the party has a fairly well orchestrated grip over all aspects of society and that is strengthening. And I think, you know, a lot of people in China have a lot of complaints about a lot of things. Um, I think most people, however, don't really conceptualize an alternative and are very nervous about sort of a chaos or, or uh, disruption uh, kind of scenario. So the consent of the governed, it's a little bit coerced, but it's, it's there, I think, for the most part. But OK, but the question is, OK, suppose that all falls apart, what then happens? Uh, I think the most likely scenario based on uh, institutional dynamics in Chinese history is that it falls apart because there's some kind of schism of leadership at the top. It doesn't become because there's an uprising from below. There's some deep, deep rift that they can't solve um, at, the, at the top. And I, I think it's a scenario in some ways like the collapse of the Soviet Union in the sense that you have a division at the top and some guy, the Chinese Boris Yeltsin, concludes that his or her uh, best uh, option is not to stick with the status quo but to break apart the status quo and create something else. And that could be a military dictatorship or it could be you know, some kind of strongman rule or something else. Um, but it would have to start with a schism at the top. And then the question would be, you know, basically, does the country fall into civil war as a result of that? Because no, uh, the new Boris Yeltsin is not, in fact, he's strong enough to break apart, but not strong enough to consolidate the authority. Um, or do you have a relatively swift transition into the new thing, whatever it is? And the new thing, I think the most likely scenario would be, it would be some kind of, like, strongman type of rule as opposed to a democratic up, up Um It's I'm not really a political scientist. This is not my uh, domain of expertise. And I'm sure there are people much smarter than I who have thought this through more carefully. I don't think it's a very, I think it is very hard to come up with a China's 
Communist Party collapse scenario that winds up looking very good for anyone. I think it is basically a very bad thing. And from a political transition standpoint, I think the best that we can hope for is that you have a leadership, probably not this one, unfortunately, that understands that some kind of a uh, transition to a more participatory system is necessary and starts to orchestrate a slow, gradual change, similar to what occurred in Taiwan in the 1980s. Right? That would be the best scenario. Unfortunately, I don't see that on the horizon. And what I see, just to conclude on this, the thing that does scare me a little bit uh, as I said, I, th I think we can we can bank on political stability for the next five years at least, and probably a bit longer. The way Xi Jinping seems to be running things at the moment, uh, he has broken a lot of the precedents, he has broken a lot of the rules, and a lot of political observers think that he is setting himself up for a third term, which is not the precedent that we've had for the last 25 years, is that when you get to the top, you have two five-year terms, and then you hand off to the next crowd. Um, and that process has been repeated a couple of times and seemed fairly stable. And if you can orchestrate succession successfully, then your regime can last a long time. And that one of the big differences between China and the Soviet Union is the Soviet Union never had a peaceful transfer of power at the top. It was always a death or a coup d'etat. And China has now done that depending on how you count it two or three times. Um, if you break those rules and say, no, we're not going to have an orderly succession, it's all about me, Xi Jinping, and I'm going to personalize rule, then you, then you get into the real authoritarian government trap, which is that after the big guy dies or becomes incompetent for whatever reason, you have no answer for what comes next, and then everyone else who is in the system starts fighting. And I'm quite concerned that sort of later in the 2020s, we wind up with that kind of political dynamic, and that, that could be bad. So we'll have to see how, how things work out in the next uh, party congress, I think. Yeah. I'm curious, you have some pretty smart people in China, and I'm wondering, are they doing the same kind of analysis about our economy and our interests <laughs> and how it would affect them? How do you think they see what we're going through right now? Uh, that's a good question. There are a lot of smart people in China, and they spend, I think, a lot of time thinking about problems in the rest of the world. And they do spend a lot of time thinking about the US, that the US is basically the only country that they care about, to be blunt, um, other than themselves. Um, uh, I think there are probably a lot of conversations going on. I, the, the, the one that I would focus on is that I think there was a sense up until the global crisis that the US provided a lot of models that were worth emulating at least parts of them. Not, not sort of like one man, one vote democracy, but a lot of other elements of how we did things. Um, and I think that was really disrupted by the global crisis. There really was a sense that, oh, these guys were not as smart as they thought they were. They were running a deeply flawed system. I don't think Donald Trump helps that, frankly, um, uh, at least from a perception point of view. Uh, so I think there's a lot of unease about um, you know, the extent to which the US is really a, um, a model that can be emulated. And I think that has given more traction to the elements in the leadership that say, no, actually, we need to have a huge state sector, and we need to do things in this very authoritarian way. Because look, you liberalize, and this is what happens, and that's bad. Right? So there's an ongoing debate. I think there are a lot of different points of views and a lot of different analysis. But I, there's def definitely been a shift over the last decade. And the people who, uh, who've always been around arguing for a very, very large state role in the economy, they got a lot more ammunition in 2008 and 2009. And that, that general line of thought, I think, is significantly more influential than it would have been, say, 10 years ago. Anyone else? If that well, is it, we can, we can, all right. Okay, Everybody we can wrap it up. Me? Okay. Thank you.